welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. About two years ago I bought a G. Bowley watchmaker's lathe with lots of tooling. The carriage didn't work and during restoration I discovered that the feed screw threads were badly damaged. To restore these threads I need a tap and die, but the thread is not any modern standard so the taps and dies are not available commercially. I measured the exact defining dimensions of the thread as 55 degrees, 0.6mm pitch and a pitch diameter of 3.61mm. 0.6mm is not common in modern thread standards and my lathe doesn't include a change gear for this pitch, so a few months ago I made a new change gear to allow me to cut threads with this pitch. The obvious solution was to make a tap myself and make a tool making video for Emma's spare room machine shop competition at the same time. In order to be certain I could reproduce the thread correctly, it made sense to make a test piece to confirm the fit. I chose a 4mm bit of brass, set it up in the lathe and got to work. The test piece needs a clean end and a gutter to ensure a clean start. Now to set up the gear train for the screw cutting feed. To cut finer threads the Proxel needs to have the larger lead screw gear installed. This is the custom change gear I made for 0.6mm pitch. You can see the whole build video via the card at the top right now. Because the thread I need to reproduce is left handed, the lathe needs this idler gear installed to reverse the direction of the lead screw. All three gears need to be correctly spaced so they engage fully but aren't tight enough to cause resistance. Finally the whole chain is connected to the spindle via this belt. Most modern thread standards are 60 degrees, so the regular threading insert needs to be replaced with this 55 degree insert to cut this thread correctly. Chips underneath the insert may cause it to move or vibrate, which would ruin the accuracy and finish. Using permanent marker or layout fluid on the diameter to be threaded will make it easier to see how the thread's progressing. The first scratch pass should always be checked to confirm the pitch has been set up correctly before proceeding. This thread is so small that I couldn't see clearly with the naked eye, so I used a loop off camera. This unsupported test part is flexing very slightly under the cutting forces, but not enough to worry about. Later spring passes should remove any variation. Cutting a left hand external thread the regular way involves cutting away from the chuck. This is a lot less risky than towards the chuck, but can be disorientating for somebody used to cutting right hand threads. I pitched this fine doesn't take many passes and after about half a millimetre of infeed I stopped to check the pitch diameter. Thread wires are a lot cheaper than a set of thread micrometers and with practice can be used to get very accurate measurements. I got really lucky and was just over dimension on the first measurement. I did another spring pass off camera which brought the thread really close to the target. The thread looked clean and well formed under magnification, but had a flat point with sharp corners rather than the rounded profile the original has. To smooth the points to more closely match the original I used a 60 degree triangular file. 
I finally used a flat file to remove any remaining burrs. A quick pass with a pipe cleaner removed any oil and filings from between the threads. Now to find out how well the thread fits. It fits smoothly in the first nut right up to near the end, where there was a bit of resistance due to some burring inside the nut. The second nut fit much more freely, probably because it's pretty badly worn. Once I have the screws in good shape, I'll consider remaking the nuts as well. This doesn't tell me that my thread is perfect by any means, but at least it tells me that the thread isn't grossly inaccurate. Making a tap requires a grade of steel which can be easily hardened in the home workshop. I chose silver steel as it's very easy to get in precise small diameters. Cutting steel involves much higher cutting forces, so with a part this narrow I'd need tailstock support. I also needed to use a piece of stock substantially longer than the part to ensure there was enough room to cut the thread without crushing the tool into the tailstock. To make sure the tailstock centre was accurate, I faced the end and drilled the centre very close to the chuck. The thread geometry maximum diameter is very slightly over 4mm, so I started with 5mm stock and turned it down to 4.1mm. Cutting the thread cleanly required a gutter near the chuck to start and plenty of space at the end, so I marked the section to be threaded with a sharpie and cleared the necessary space. A quick touch on the end of the thread with a chamfer tool and the part is ready for threading. <clears throat> what? It looks like someone forgot to check the focus while recording cutting the thread, so it's impossible to see how it went. Fortunately I have some footage of an earlier test part, so I can show you some of the things that went wrong. The length of material near the tailstock was not long enough for the threading tool to stop safely, and I crashed the tool into the live centre multiple times. This caused the tool post to shift slightly and meant that the point of the threading insert moved out of place causing the thread to be deformed. By contrast, the thread on the final steel part that I failed to film went almost perfectly. Once again I checked the dimension with threading wires. I'd overshot my target by a couple of hundredths of a millimetre. Good enough for a first prototype. I cleaned up the burrs with files and gave it a final touch up with a Kratex stick. Under magnification it looks fine and has the pointed tips I was aiming for, 
These points are larger in diameter than the rounded tops of the original thread, but when making a tap I want to be sure the profile allows plenty of room. If the pitch diameter is correct, then allowing plenty of room for the tips should be fine. If not enough room, then the thread will stick. For the next phase of the project I needed the part to fit into a collet, and the nearest size I have is 4mm, so I turned the diameter of this end down. The centre will be used later to finish the part, but more importantly will be used to align the finished tap using the tap follower. I made use of the centre at this point to improve the finish and accuracy of the final pass. The key feature in the tap geometry are the flutes, which define the cutting edges and allow chips to clear. For this tap I plan to mill the flutes into the side, but the part is too thin to do this without supporting the far end. I've solved this problem before when milling hexes, but this part is much smaller and needs to be held more precisely. This time I created a new machinist jack designed specifically to be able to clamp a small round part in place at the right height above the table. I'll make a video going into how this jack fixture was made if you're interested. To machine the flutes I used this 1.5mm ball nose carbide end mill. To cut well a carbide end mill this small needs a lot of RPM so I gave it all the Proxon has. Unfortunately a cheap machine like this can only do 2200 RPM which is way slower than ideal. The end mill is extended as far out of the collet as it can be while still fitting fully into the closing section of the collet. It needs to be this far out to clear the collet closer nut. This made me cautious about the cutting forces so I took very light 0.1mm passes. I didn't see any problems though and the end mill seemed to have no difficulty cleanly cutting through the threads. Nearer the base of the threads the engagement was heavier, but the tool stayed steady. For the last two passes the end mill was cutting a groove in the core material of the tap, so I slowed the manual feed down a little. I chose three flutes without having any real idea how I should make that decision. The hex collet block allowed me to easily set the part at the right angle for the next flute. The machining was identical to the first flute, so I'll skip it. While I was at the mill, I milled a square into the end of the tap so a tap wrench can be used to drive it. The accuracy isn't at all critical, and this was a little more straightforward than milling the flutes. The tap now has only a few minor changes to make before it's ready for hardening. Back on the lathe I brought the final part of the diameter down to size, as I no longer needed a point to hold that was larger than the threads. I then needed to remove the excess length from the tip. I thinned the material down with a parting tool before weakening it more with a hacksaw and finally breaking the part off by hand. The tap was now ready for heat treatment to harden the steel enough for it to cut other metal. This was my first proper attempt at hardening steel so I set up this equipment in my garden. The burner uses map gas, which is a lot hotter than propane. To prevent the part from scaling due to the heat, I coated it with a paste of boric acid and denatured alcohol, all held in place with a thin mesh of wire wool. 
You can see the fine strands of wire wool being burned away by the heat, but the boric acid was already covering the steel and preventing scaling. I made this low-cost hearth using bricks intended to line pizza ovens, and they seem to have no problem dealing with the heat of the map gas flame. I had a magnet sitting close by, so I could check whether the part was up to temperature. When steel reaches the critical temperature for hardening, it changes its nature and becomes non-magnetic. Once the part looked cherry red at the threaded section, I did a quick check with the magnet and then quenched it in water. The boric acid has worked pretty well to keep the tap free of scale, but to check whether it has hardened I needed to try and mark it with a file. If it has hardened, then the steel will be as hard as the cutting edges of the file, and the file won't be able to mark it. The burrs left from parting broke away, but the main body of the tap was unmarked by the file. To ensure the tap isn't too brittle, it needs to be tempered. I did this by gently heating it with the flame until it just started changing colour to straw, and then quenched it to hold the tempering. At this point the tap is hard enough to cut, but doesn't yet have the right shape. I used this commercial taper tap to work out what shape I had to grind the threads into. The taper is almost exactly 5 degrees. Grinding the taper is a perfect opportunity to use my new D-bit grinder. It comes with a 5C collet spindle, which is perfectly for holding and spinning the tap. The first grind I did was to clean up the end of the tap and grind it into a 45 degree point. As I rotated the spindle, I advanced it slowly towards the wheel. To avoid uneven wear on the wheel surface, I moved the contact point periodically. The next grind I did was to taper the threads to match the commercially made tap. The commercial tap had a taper which reached around six threads back from the tip, and I aimed to match this. To try out the tap on an easy material, I drilled a suitable sized hole in this brass puck. The tap didn't cut at all, though the edges are sharp. Clearly the geometry isn't right yet. Let's take another look at the commercially made tap. Each of the threads in the tapered area has some back relief ground into it in addition to being tapered along the length. This makes sense as pretty much all cutting tools require some relief behind the cutting edge. I spent some time experimenting on the grinder, very carefully ensuring I didn't overgrind it or damage the geometry. Eventually I had a relief which looked something like the commercially made tap. And it works! The footage of my experimental grinding is way too long to fit into this video, and it's too messy to be really useful. I'll make another video about it once I know what I'm doing. The result is definitely a threaded hole.